like, oh God, just to come this evening, Lord, and bring your strength, Father, and uh, let us hear your words tonight, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, they say you should write about what you know. They say you should talk about what you experience. And they say you should preach what you are already living, not practice what you preach. That's kind of after the fact, isn't it? And today I'm going to bring for you a message that um, is honest and open. And I can't help it because that's just kind of the person I am. I'm the kind of person who wears their heart on their sleeve. I try to live my life as much as I can as an open book. I don't have anything to hide. I'm not a good pretender, at least not anymore. Uh, I can't be happy when I'm sad, and I can't be sad when I'm happy. Basically, what you're going to get here is what you got, which is what I am. And so today, I have written, I'm going to speak, and I'm going to preach about the only thing that I know am experiencing and am currently living, and that is grief. And I'm going to do my best not to cry and make y'all cry, um, and also try to read through my tears. <laughs> I um, lost my grandfather back in February, found my father dead in his bed on April 14th, And last Tuesday, unknown to me, our cat had jumped in the car after I got home, and I didn't know he was there. We found him a little too late. <laughs> and so our dear friend has left us with another hole in our heart and hurting. So yes, unfortunately, lately, Grief is about the only thing I can talk to you about. Well, this is what I know. What I know is that there is no specified time to grieve. That there is no time when grief just ends or expires. There's no uh, expiration date on it like a milk of carton that tells you when to just toss it out of your life. That there's no pill, there's no magic potion, there is nothing that can, you can take to cure yourself from this grief. And not even enough coffee in the world. And believe me, I have been living on a lot of coffee since February. There is not enough coffee in the world that can make grief leave you like that blessed morning fog that leaves after your first cup. And although we hear that there are stages of grief, in my experience, they seem more like mountains. And each one of them does need to be climbed. They say that time heals all wounds, but they fail to mention exactly how much time that is. Or if, in fact, we will live long enough to actually see that pass. Grief is just one of those things. I mean, each one of us would describe it in our own way. In fact, there are probably thousands and thousands of different descriptions of grief, and each one of them is absolutely correct. We would have to put them in the dictionary and order them all number one, because each one just as important as the other. And if we were to draw a picture, again, there would be thousands and thousands of pictures of equally correct descriptions for this so easy to say five letter, one syllable word, grief. And maybe that's why in the Bible we can find many many pictures, many descriptions of grief. And maybe that's why there are so many people shown to us in the Bible that experience grief. And maybe that's why this little word grief 
is shown to us by oh so many people. I mean, why wouldn't the Bible just be filled with all the happy stuff? We see a picture and a description of grief in the prophet Elijah. Elijah, we know, he is this great and mighty prophet. He does so many amazing things from God. We also know him as a prophet who suffered from depression, right? He leaves this major victory, does this awesome thing. God does this amazing thing through him, and we find him under a broom tree praying that he might give up and that he would be left to die. And you know, I sincerely believe his picture of depression comes from a place of grief. You see, because when God asks him a little later on, he says, Elijah, what are you doing? And basically, Elijah says, all my friends are dead. He basically, in Elijah's words, he says, they have been put to death with a sword. And I see the picture of grief in Elijah's life. You see, Elijah's picture of grief looks like a man who has no appetite, can't eat. He's depressed. He's ready to quit. He's walking away from everything in life and just waiting for life itself to leave him. And yes, I have felt some of Elijah's picture of grief as well. But just like Elijah, I have been fed by God's angels, many of them right here in this room. His place of grief also includes amending from a mighty father. Elijah, eventually he moves on, and he continues to do his job once again. Sometimes we read through the Bible and we think he's just immediately taken up to heaven, but he doesn't. He goes back to work eventually. He goes back to work and he continues to do his job again, and he works through this terrible grief. God brings truth into Elijah's life. We see a picture of grief, certainly, in the life of Job. I mean, come on, Job, he loses his family. He has seven sons, three daughters. He loses his home. He loses all of his livelihood. I lost a cat, and he lost 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 oxen, 500 donkeys, and besides his family, hundreds of of servants and people that he had grown to know and love. And I think it's worth reading Job's story, Job chapter 1, verse 13. It says, One day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys were plowing or the the oxen were plowing and the donkeys were grazing nearby and the Sabaeans attacked and carried them off. They put the servants to the sword and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he's speaking, another messenger comes and said the fire of God fell from the sky and burned up the sheep and the servants and I am the only one here who has escaped to tell you. While he's still speaking, another messenger comes and says, The Chaldeans formed three raiding parties and swept down on your camels and carried them off. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. I'm sure Job is thinking, well, at least my family's okay. But while he was speaking... Yet another messenger came and said, Your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on them, and they are dead, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. 
And at this, Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head, and he fell to the ground in worship and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. And in all of this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. I would say that Job goes through many mountains of grief. Many. And the description and picture of grief in Job's life is a man who loses everything, yet he does not, will not turn his back on God. He finds his position not under a tree waiting to die like Elijah, but he places himself on his knees and he begins to do something that seems pretty incredible. He worships this God who has taken everything from him. He then eventually becomes so sick, so ill, but he still does not turn his back on God. And in fact, Job loses his friends. Most of them walk away from him, and they do not understand what Job is going through. Job's picture of grief shows us that even friends may walk away from us in these difficult times, but God never does. Job's picture of grief shows us truly that grief is between you or me and God only. It is between the sufferer and his healer. Job's picture of grief in the Bible shows us that our Heavenly Father uses all things to bring something good. And it is incredible that Job, who is described Before all of this happens, he is described as a man who is without fault and of complete integrity. But Job, chapter 42, verse 5, says, I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. You see, Job only truly saw God through this five-letter word of grief, even though he lived a good and upstanding life. Job's faith grew through his grief. How about a picture of Naomi? Certainly, if there's a picture of grief, it is Naomi. Naomi loses her husband and her two sons, And not only has she lost her husband and her two sons, but she is left with two daughter-in-laws that she has absolutely no way of taking care of them. And her picture of grief is not like Job's exactly. Naomi pushes away the only family that she has. Go and leave me, she tells her daughter-in-laws. But there is one, Ruth who will stay by her side, who is unwilling to leave. You see, Naomi's grief is so deep, so hurtful, that she literally changes her name to Mara and tells everyone, don't even call me by that person that I was because the person that I am now is bitter, which is what Mara means. I believe Naomi's grief was so bad that she couldn't even reconcile herself with the person that she once was. Grief, let me get this through you, grief changes us. And sometimes grief looks like bitterness. Sometimes grief looks like a person who pushes away all of their loved ones. It just does. It's not right, it's not wrong, it's just another picture of grief. And I know I have felt this at times, the isolation, the desire for solitude, the not wanting to answer a text or a phone call or an email or just hide. But Naomi's description of grief doesn't end with loneliness and bitterness. But over time, like Elijah, like Job, she becomes better instead of bitter. 
over time, she literally becomes the great-great-grandmother of King David. And through the line of David comes, you guessed it, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. The son of the almighty God came through the line of a person who allowed grief to bring her to a state of terrible bitterness. There is hope through grief. Great hope. But perhaps in the Bible, it is the side-by-side descriptions of Mary and Peter that really are startling at how different each one of us tackles this grief thing. I mean, Mary's grief brings her right to the last place she saw Jesus. She goes to the tomb. Peter's grief brings him to the last place before he even met Jesus. He goes back to work, fishing. Mary cries, falls into a hot mess, and she feels completely lost. But Peter, Peter busies himself with work, anything to keep his mind off of this pain that he's feeling. Mary searches, Peter hides, and they are both very good, loving, passionate followers of Jesus Christ. Sometimes grief looks like us falling in a corner and crying our eyes out. Sometimes grief looks like us cleaning up the house from top to bottom. Sometimes grief looks like you go to work and you refuse to cry and you bury yourself in the everyday mundane things that you can possibly do in the physical so that you don't deal with the hurt that is happening on the inside. Yes, there are many, many pictures of grief. And I have to mention that the Bible shows us a picture of an aching and agonizing grief on the cross when Jesus, who is fully human, cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And yes, I have to say yes. Sometimes grief looks like God has forsaken you. He has left you on a cross to bear all by yourself. And if you feel that way, you are in good company because the Son of God himself experienced that. Yet in the picture of grief on the cross, it does not end there. You see, grief is never the end. It is not a finish line Over time, we see an empty tomb. And many of us will walk around with the nail marks of grief in our hands and in our feet, but yet we have that promise, the ability to walk again, even if we still hold those scars. Is there one description of grief? No. Is there one how-to way to deal with grief? No. Your grief, my grief, is just that. It is yours, or it is mine. It is never ours. Grief is as diverse as the many people who have been called to bear it, and everyone's grief is unique as their own fingerprint. Grief cannot be ignored, it cannot be bypassed, it cannot be walked away from. It is not the sign on the road you must travel, but rather it is the road. And these feelings of grief for me recently are all too familiar. While I have not had a close death in my family for many years, I too had worked through grief when I was just nine years old. And it took me many years to get through (laughs) the grief, many years of hurt and pain, and many years of, frankly, not dealing with it at all. When I was nine years old, my little brother was born, and I didn't know he was a little brother. You know, back then, they they didn't tell you if you're out a boy or a girl. Now everybody can find out right away. That's kind of cool, but not back then. We didn't know. And uh, I got the, my brother and I were at school, and we got the announcement over the 
speaker, we were both called down to the office. No, we were not in trouble. We knew exactly what was going on. We were going to find out if we were going to have a little brother or a little sister. My brother, of course, you know what he wanted, a brother. You know what I wanted, a sister. When we got down there, they said, you have a baby brother. And my mouth blurted out my inmost heart. I said, oh, shoot. And a few days later, my little brother died. And I learned what I thought was a valuable lesson at the time about how you shouldn't say things how you really feel. I made a promise. I made a vow to myself that I would never say anything that I might regret again. And I determined that somehow I would punish myself for this. I really didn't have very many friends, and I never shared my feelings with anyone, ever. And when I became a teenager, I began living a life that was very self-destructive. I became anemic, then bulimic. I started drinking. I wanted to die. I began living this stupid life. I put myself in these dangerous situations, tempting God to punish me for those words that I had said so long ago. In all of this, I tell you, God just never, ever walks away. And just like every single picture of grief in the Bible, God never walks away from you. In fact, the only thing that got me out of this self-torture was finding out I was pregnant with my first child. Because, see, I could hurt myself all I wanted, but now that there was somebody else that I could hurt, I stopped hurting myself. And my poor husband, <laughs> our relationship was difficult to say. Imagine if you were married to somebody who would never, ever express their feelings. <laughs> No, there was anger or hurt or anything like that, and I would never, ever express those feelings for fear of experiencing that terrible regret that I lived with for so many years. Well, God was good to me. He brought a wonderful husband into my life, and even in the midst of running away from my grief, it would be more than 12 years and many, many more years of heaping destruction in my life before I would sit and allow God to mend me. And certainly, you all can agree that my have been mended. I mean, certainly by the fact that I am standing before you, pouring my heart out, sharing my feelings, has got to be a witness that Jesus Christ has touched me and healed me. We cannot run away from our grief. It just runs with us but so does our Heavenly Father. I uh, read this quote this week. Uh, hit my soul really hard. And it was by a writer. He's not a Christian writer. He said, uh, guilt is a tireless horse, and grief ages into sorrow, and sorrow is an enduring rider. I was feeling really down. <laughs> tell you what, I was feeling really down, and that really hit my soul hard, and I heard God say, yeah, but you can always get a new rider. Hallelujah. We can always get a new rider. You see, sorrow may last for the night, but joy does come in the morning, and Jesus' burden is light. There's no set amount of hours or minutes or days we need to be in the Father's arms to work through our grief. There isn't a specific number of Hail Marys to say, sorry to tell you. Grief is often the only road that takes you to any other place. Just travel upon it. But all I know is that grief can never, ever happen without the first feeling. The more important feeling, the divine emotion, love. See, the truth was that I had loved my little brother, Callie, the moment I saw him, even deeper the moment I held him. 
But lest we forget that God himself grieved. Love the moment he first saw us. He first saw you when he first saw me. The moment he first held the dust from which we came. Lest we forget that God himself is acquainted with our sorrows. The Bible says God grieved over humanity. Why? Because he loved it first. God was willing to grieve because he had first loved. And lately this grief has been pretty hard. (laughs) Can't help but relate to Job with the wave after wave of hurt and pain and loss. And I'll be honest with you, if I had listened to my physical yearnings, uh, I'd probably never eat again. I don't have much of an appetite. I'd probably go look for a broom tree somewhere, lay down. I wouldn't love, care about, or connect with anyone again and I'd become bitter like Naomi. I'd lock myself in a room, and I would just not come out. Because certainly coming out requires feeling pain. I'd stop speaking, and I'd find a way, truly, to punish myself for what happened to our cat. But yet I know, sorry, Thank you, sorry. Yet I know, in all of these pictures of grief, no matter how each person dealt with them in the Bible, God was, without a doubt, there. God never turns his back on those that are hurting. And I know that he mended each person's heart in the specific way that it really needed to be mended. You see, there's no Disney formula for success when it comes to grief. It's not like a Hollywood movie where we can just see the resolution coming, right? You're like, oh, things are about to wind up. The movie's almost over. What I know is he nurtured a depressed Elijah who couldn't eat, didn't want to get up, when Elijah never thought his grief would pass. What I know is that he walked with a bitter Naomi who pushed away everyone around her, who tried to love her, everyone. She didn't feel that she could be lovable or had anything to give. And in her grief, she never knew that there would be a point where she would get past that. Yet she did. What I know is that God came to a humble, hurting worshiper who didn't deserve what happened in his life, named Job. And when Job certainly didn't see that things would pass. What I know is that he seeks out a runner like Peter, who didn't see that his grief would one day be gone. And he calls a lost hot mess like Mary by her name when she at one point, had not seen that her grief would be gone. What I know about grief is that God is in it, and God will reveal himself to us, whether it's days, weeks, years, or entire lives. He will be found and revealed in our grief. What I also know is that God has a place without grief. Uh, He didn't just 
imagine it and think it up, but he has already created it, placed it, called it into being, and he has appointed a time where you and I will actually live in it, even if enough time hasn't passed for our grief to leave us on this earth, we will be in a place where grief won't even be a distant memory. And what I also know is that for me, I have to walk through this grief in a healthy way. I know I don't want to go through the destructive behaviors that I have done in the past, and I wouldn't. I know that I've been running to God, but I'm not, not mended yet. I'm getting there. And I know I need to sit time to sit before God and let him do his work. And quite frankly, I need to sleep well. I've wanted to quit like Elijah, be honest with you. God won't let me. The thoughts of stopping connection service have been rolling around in my head. Thoughts, me saying, God, I can't do this, I can't do this, I can't do this. I tried to strike a bargain with God. All right, I'm being honest with you guys. Please don't tell me you don't do this because I know we all must do this, right? I tried to strike a bargain with God. I'm like, I don't want to do this. And I, and I never got God saying, okay, stop. So, you know, you can't. <laughs> and on Wednesday morning, I lost my insulin pump. God and I talk all the time. So usually, if I'm not saying something out loud, I'm saying something in here to God. We're just having this kind of constant conversation all the time. That or I'm lost in some geeky Star Trek thing. But usually it's me talking to God, right? That's happening all the time. And so I had lost my insulin pump and I felt God say, I'll show you where it is if you promise you won't quit. You see, I had been crying out to God. I can't do this. I'm too empty. I'm done. I hurt too badly. Who wants a pastor to stand in front of them broken? What can I give? I can't do this anymore. I'll show it to you if you promise not to quit. So I refused to say it for a very long time. I looked, and I looked, and I looked, and I looked, and I became desperate, honestly. I started to think, I've got to find this pump. I need this pump. And God, all in the background, I'll show it to you if you promise not to quit. I'll show it to you if you promise not to quit. I'm stubborn. God knows this. But I'm not out and out disobedient. Not anymore. I won't be. I can't be. I just can't. I'm to that point in my relationship with Jesus. So I can't. So I gave in a little bit. I said, listen to me. God must have laughed at me. I said, if I find it in a place that I have already looked, then I won't quit. See, I had looked in a lot of places several times. So I thought, well, you see, because I knew if I said I won't quit and God revealed it to me, I would have to do it because I wouldn't be out and out disobedient. But I tried to give myself a little bit of something here. And I was like, okay, God, if I find it in a place where I've already looked, then I won't quit. Immediately, I walked over to the blankets that I had searched hundreds of times <laughs> Probably not hundreds. I know I'm exaggerating there. But several times, I believe Eric even looked in those blankets. I don't know if you did or not. You were, you were late to the search party. Um, and I picked up the blankets, and it literally fell out of my foot. But I am stubborn. <laughs> okay, God. I guess you don't want me to quit. Can I stop for the summer? I can't do this. I don't have anything to give God. I, 
I don't know what to do. I, I'm so hurt. I'm so broken. I, can I just stop for the summer? So I struck a bargain with God again. I said, um, I'll ask Jax. If she seems relieved, now I'm talking about my grief, but let me tell you, our whole family is grieving terribly, terribly. And uh, to the point where we've all shed many more tears in probably this whole week, months, than they did when they were babies crying for their bottles. <laughs> Any one of us. Anyways, so I struck a bargain with God. I said, okay, God, I'll ask Jax. If she feels relieved that we might stop for the summer, then I'll do that. So I asked Jax. And I said, Jax, what do you, would you think if we stopped connection for the summer? She said her words, I would be sad if we stopped. Oh, sad is not relief, is it? <laughs> well, then she came with a suggestion. She's like, maybe we could do music and prayer. And I thought, I heard God go, yeah, you can. So I don't know what's going to happen. I, I feel like God has, don't hear me wrong, but he's kind of released me from this burden. And I say burden. Burden, we say, is always bad. But burden is not always bad. Burden means you have been assigned to care. And what I have been assigned to care about recently that has overwhelmed my soul is literally preparing a message. <laughs> I know that sounds crazy, but a lot of work goes into a message. And I have a great burden on my soul that I want to bring to you what God has for you. And I spend a lot of time reading and studying and saying, God, what is it that you want me to bring for? What is it that you have? What words do you want them to hear? And I've been spending a lot of time doing that, and I haven't spent time listening for me. And I felt when Jax made that suggestion, I felt in my spirit God say, yes that that is what he wanted. I'm like, just let me out. <laughs> and he's like, no. You see, I know that God has a plan and a purpose. And I don't know exactly what our summer months are going to look like, and I'm sure that God will have me say things because <laughs> you can't shut me up sometimes. Um, but I, I'm not going to have that overwhelming burden to prepare something, which means that maybe God is going to put something on your heart. Maybe God is going to ask you to say something. Maybe God is going to bring us together, support each other, lift each other up in prayer. And I'm, I'm excited because I know God has good plans. I'm excited because I know I need healing in my life. And I'm excited because it's all him. So be ready for God to do something amazing, because I am. I don't know what it is. The kids and Eric and I spent an entire summer every Sunday t going to the park, offering worship, worship services for our community, and nobody came. Not one person. It was the most amazing time in our lives. Right? When you say that, all oh, everybody shaking. It was... It was hot, yes, but, it, but spiritually, spiritually, it was amazing, wasn't it? Spiritually, it was amazing. So you never know what God's going to do. You really don't. And I would ask that you guys would be kind to me, like Ruth was with Naomi, that you'd walk alongside us, help us through this hard time, and let's let God do what he always does, reveal himself show himself, and make something that you and I 
can say with conviction and without a doubt that it is good. And so today we're going to take communion, and I'm going to offer you communion through the grieving eyes of Jesus. Like I've just done, Jesus was open, honest with his friends the night he offered up his body and his blood. Imagine that. He didn't hide his feelings. And when you read through Scripture, and I'm going to read from Matthew 26, when you read through Scripture, you can't help. Boy, I wish I could read all of Scripture because I'm only going to read one passage because if I could read all of the accounts of the Last Supper in the anguish that Jesus feels, the grief that he feels for himself, for those that are going to be lost for a while, for those that are going to feel grief. You see, Jesus didn't bottle it all up inside, but he did let it out. And I think that that is a lesson to us, and I hope you are not offended by my honesty and uh, my tears and my heartache and my bareness before you. I just want to bring this over. Matthew 26. Uh, I was... Uh, okay. Okay. Verse 17. On the first day of the feast of the unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? He replied, go into the city to a certain man and tell him the teacher says, my appointed time is near. I am going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. And when evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. And while they were eating, think about what's on Jesus' mind. While they were eating, He said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. And they were very sad and began to say to him one after the other, surely not I, Lord. And Jesus replied, the one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he were not even born. Then Judas the one who would betray him said, Surely not I, Rabbi. And Jesus answered, Yes, it is you. And while they were eating, Jesus took the bread and through a broken, grieving heart, he gave thanks and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, Take and eat this is my body. And then he took the cup. He gave thanks. He offered it to them saying, "Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of the sins. And I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you." in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And we see a further picture of Jesus' grief, the Garden of Gethsemane. We're all familiar with that. Jesus continues to grieve. There is no appointed time for grief to leave. Jesus knew the end. And you and I know the end, too. Our grief 
will not be here forever. Yet, Jesus still took time to grieve. 